and welcome back. So we've talked about how to create a confidence level, a confidence interval, if we have ourselves some information about the population, namely sigma. We'll use, for a mu estimation, we'll use x bar as our point estimator, and we'll create a range, a confidence interval around that, of plus or minus e. We saw that sometimes you don't have information about the population, in which case you can get a standard deviation. Uh, calculation of the sample rather than the standard deviation calculation of the population and that requires you to use the TC scores, the student T distribution. What I didn't mention last time because my battery was running out is that the student T distribution was actually invented by a statistician uh, by the name of Gossip and he worked for the Guinness Brewing Company. It was unpopular with Guinness to publish your research so he had a um, he had to use a bit of a pseudonym, and so he called himself a student of statistics. And so when he created this t-distribution, it was the student's t-distribution. Student apostrophe s, because he was called capital S student. That was his, his pseudonym. And so he published this, and so we keep on using these numbers that he's gotten. Um, I should point out that if you looked cautiously at the, the first video in this section using sigma, and the second video using s, you will notice that slightly unfortunately, my sigma distribution using z-scores was a little bit wider than my t-score calculation. That was because of the way I chose to pseudo-randomly generate my salary calculations. Um, in general, all things being equal, you expect t-scores to be a little wider because you expect the t-number to be bigger than the z-c. So the t-c number is a little bit bigger than the ZC number, and so, again, all things staying the same, you expect one to be uh, larger, namely the T-score. So we kind of expect the opposite, usually, of what happened. I'll admit I took a few minutes to take a look at my random number generator. I made a teensy bit of a typo. The calculations that I did are perfectly correct. I'm just saying your instinct should be TC scores are wider than ZC scores in general for the same batch of numbers, for the same rough deviations. We want to keep on with this idea of confidence interval, and so we want to continue talking, and you should notice a pattern start to emerge. We talked about ZC scores when we had some information about the population, and I said that's pretty rare. Then we talked about t-scores using just sample data, and I said that's maybe more common and more understandable that we have that kind of information. And once we've talked then about the, the best case, the usual case, then it's time to talk about the binomial case. And you're going to see this three-step pattern where we talk about z-c's, t-scores, and binomials repeat itself pretty much in every section now from here on out. We'll, we'll have that flavor to look forward to. So be expecting that. Again, compare and contrast. What is the difference between the first section with ZCs and the second section with TCs? What's the same? What's different? Now we're going to talk about binomial. As is usual for the binomial calculations we do, think of the, the end of module 6. We need to calculate uh, make sure it's legitimate to use normal methods on the binomial distribution. That only works when we have a couple of preconditions. One, we should have enough in our sample size, so n should be big, for some definition of big. And two, we need to have at least five successes and at least five failures. You need a little bit of that balance happening. Again, uh, theoretically, maybe this is a little bit... Um, uh, somewhat dodgy, but in actual empirical practice, as long as we've got five on each side, it works quite well. And again, as you saw from the stuff in Module 6 where we talked about binomial probability, being able to approximate with the continuity modifiers of plus 0.5 and minus 0.5 and using the normal curve, we were able to use the normal curve to get a very close calculation, it was very close to the actual binomial probability, without having to calculate the binomial formula many times. So this is a bit of an advantage thing to do. For binomial probability though, we're going to be talking about ratios. So one of the ways you can distinguish between your data, I said if you look at a word problem, you're trying to decide what do we have. That's one of those, those good skills to have. Well, 
if you have information about the population deviation, you know you want to talk about ZC scores. If you only have sample data, then you have to use TC. And if you don't have a precise number for sample data, but instead you have some sort of a ratio that you can build, like we're about to look at, then you start to think of yourself binomial probability. So let's talk about President Truman. President Truman, back in the day, had a poll. Most presidents do. In fact, you can Google Gallup polls and you can find most presidents' approval ratings kind of by, I think they do a weekly running average or some such. But anyway, President Truman's maybe a little bit removed from today, so it's safe to talk about him. And at one point, his presidency, I think overall this was his average, he had 454 approved people approving out of 1,000 people in the poll. What I'm going to do is we're going to take these numbers, we're going to calculate several things and just see how that works. First of all, for it to make sense to talk about binomial, we have to ask ourselves, does this follow a binomial concept? Do people either approve or disapprove of a president? Well, yes, the way these polls are built. It depends how you build them. You could have a maybe category, of course. You could use some sort of liquor scale on 1 to 5. How, how happy does this president make you feel? But in general, presidents, when they do approval polls, you just simply ask people, do you approve overall of the job that Mr. Truman is doing? Yes or no? So this is entirely a win or lose calculation. Check one for the binomial process. Next check, we need to see, do we have at least five wins and five losses? The answer is yes. Out of a thousand people, he had 454 of them say, yes, I approve wholeheartedly of the job Mr. Truman's doing. And on the other side, a thousand minus 454 will definitely leave me with at least five failures. Five people saying, no, disapprove. So, we know that we've got five on each side. A thousand certainly seems like a large number, and it's big enough for our purposes. You kind of worry when n is like five or ten, maybe, that you should just use the binomial uh, formula straight up. We don't need to. This is bigger. And again, we have the same idea. This is only a thousand people. Granted, there weren't 300 plus million people in the United States back in Mr. Truman's day, but when he was president, I'm pretty confident there were more than a thousand people in the United States. So we definitely have a sample, and we're in the business of using our point estimates, p hat, to try to calculate what the population approval rating, p, is. So let's talk about p hat. p hat is like the x bar of proportions. It's r, the number of successes, divided by m, the total number of attempts. So we asked a thousand people, and of those thousand people, 454 of them said we approve. So for us, p hat, 454 divided by 1,000 equals 0 0.454. The math there was pretty simple because I made it so. This is p hat. p hat is a sample proportion. And we're trying to figure out what lowercase p is. So again, we're going to use our normal idea. We're going to subtract and add some error term to p. Because this is binomial, we know from module 6 that when we talk about binomials and we want to calculate them without using a, a bajillion incarnations of the binomial formula, we talk about normal curve. So we're not talking about student t distribution anymore. That's very much limited to when we only have sample data. And that sample data is only sample data, and it's very small we use normal curves when we talk about either some population data that we have access to, maybe some sample data, but we do have some information about the population, or we can talk about the normal curve here for two reasons. One, we have a very large sample, it's a thousand here, so n is big, and two, this is binomial. So unlike with salaries, where you could have all sorts of different salaries. Here, there's only two possibilities, win or lose. So because we've limited the type of information we can have, because we only have yes or no, pass, fail, win or lose, approval or disapproval, and because we have such a large sample size, this allows us to step back into normal probability calculations, and these will be pretty accurate. So, our estimator for, for p is going to be p hat. This is our point estimator, and it's going to be about 0.454. We now have to calculate what e is. And e is given to us by this formula right here. 
p hat times 1 minus p, all divided by m. If you recall, sigma n p q for, uh, um, for, for binomial probability. Remember, mu is just going to be n times p. So this, if we divide out by n, gets us our standard error that we're going to have here. So this is very much the formula for the very first thing we did, namely the ZC scores, with the one teeny difference that it's binomial probability now. So they subbed out some of those numbers and recalculated them. Most textbooks um, have a, a walkthrough of how you do that algebra. If you've taken a, a college algebra class before this one, I highly recommend that you look through it based on the idea that it's always better to understand more than it is to understand less. However, if you haven't taken college algebra and if a formula symbolic manipulation of equations is complicated, it is not a prerequisite for this course. You can just take me at my word. This is your error term if you've got binomial probability. You know you have binomial probability when you're talking about proportions or ratios, when you have a success and failure only scenario, and it makes sense to use standard z-scores because we have so many people in our sample. So to calculate E, if I can find my eraser, maybe I can do this over here on the left. We need to have a ZC score. Let's go ahead and find the 95% confidence interval. It's going to seem like I use that a lot. That's simply because it's a very common one to use. Um, remember how we looked those up. We'd like to have 95% in the middle here. We would like to find this ZC score. If there's 95% in the middle, you know there's 5% on either edge, which means there's 2.5% on this left edge. 5, 6, 7, 97.5% on the total here. So I'm looking up 0.975 on my Z-score table. And as I do that, 0.975 here, I find out that the z-score is 1.96. This, of course, will be negative 1.96 to keep that symmetry there for the 95%. So I have my zc score of 1.96 times the square root of p hat, which is 0.454 times 1 minus p hat. We might call that q hat, thinking back to the p and q probability estimators for binomial. 1 minus 0 0.454. All divided by n, which is 1,000. This is our e. Again, we can use our calculator to figure that out. Let's go ahead and type that in. Get that here so we can see. So I have 1.96, 1.96 times the square root, and then inside the square root I've got myself a fraction bar. On the top I have 0 0.45, 454 times parens 1 minus 0 0.454. Close the parens, get down into the denominator base, type in 1000, and that means I can get out here and hit enter, and I can figure out my error, 0.0308. 0 0.0308, it keeps on going. Again, remember that ideally you are not going to round until the very end. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the store button on my calculator. Let's see if I can actually successfully pull this off. I think I hit store, and then I hit a letter. I'm going to call this, let's call it Z, for lack of anything. Let's call it A. So I'm cycling through here, hit enter. I have now stored that in position A. If I want to recall it, I'm going to hit second recall and I'll be able to find 0.03 here. And that's because I don't want to round until the very end. You always know, have to watch that rounding. Premature rounding, now granted this is probably enough decimal places that we're okay because we tend to round to one or two decimal places here depending on the particular calculations we're making. But premature rounding is a very bad thing to do. It can lead to larger errors in calculation because you're making rounding and you're rounding, you, you keep on rounding and you get yourself some very inaccurate stuff. So try to keep nice solid whole numbers until you reach the end.
well, not whole numbers, but you get what I mean. So this is our E. We know what our calculation is here. It's 0.454. So as we want to calculate this out and get ourselves a range, a range that 95% of the time that we do this, this range will actually successfully have the population measure. We can go ahead and take this uh, estimate and add uh, 0.454 minus uh, this error. We get ourselves 0 0.42314. Again, at this point it's safe to round, so we're going to use our normal convention. I think of one further decimal place for a calculated value than we had gone, so 0.4231 with rounding is less than P, which is less than 0.454 plus second recall. We scroll down and select A. That gives me 0 0.484. With one more decimal place, it's 8.5, so I turn that 8 into a 9. This is a range, and if we convert these to percents, 42.31% is less than Truman, probability of Truman approval is less than 48.49%. Uh, Every time that Mr. Truman would have had this poll conducted for him, or someone else would conduct it on his behalf, or at least interested in him, every time we grabbed a thousand people at random from the voting population or the population of the United States and asked them yes or no, up or down, do you like this dude or not, we would expect to get a range, and we'd get different ranges each time depending on how many people we, uh, well, we'd always ask a thousand people, but you'd get different groups of people at random. However, of, we created all those confidence intervals and lined them all up. 95% of the time, we would expect the real, his actual real approval rating, if we'd successfully managed to ask, I don't know, all 150 million or so that there would have been in the U.S. back then, we would have found his approval rating in there 95% of the time. So, even without knowing exactly what Mr. Truman's approval rating truly was for everyone in America, I can be very, very confident that it's somewhere in here. And what does this mostly tell me if I was going to be Mr. Truman's presidential advisor? I'd say, President Truman, more than half the people in this country dislike the way you're running things. Now, it's pretty close to half, possibly, but it could be as high as almost 60%, sir. We have a lower range and an upper limit here, and we say, well, somewhere in there is your actual approval rating. And the beauty of it, we only had to phone a thousand people. That's pretty convenient. So this is one thing we can do in this section. We're able to calculate this, this binomial probability, and we're able to figure out this confidence range. Now, there's something else we can do in this section as well. Let's say, let's say this. I said we had pulled a thousand people this time, and maybe that was good enough for our work. Notice, though, that that did mean that we had plus or minus 3%, so that kind of gave us some wiggle room. Incidentally, if you ever watch a presidential election or really just turn on to one of the 24-hour news channels, they would write all of this in another way, right? We had calculated P hat as being 0.454, so they would write this as 45.4% plus or minus... 3.08. They probably would round that and say plus or minus 3%. These are entirely the exact same way of saying the same idea. This seems to be the way that most news channels talk about this these days. So you got that plus or minus 3%. Always watch for that plus or minus 3%. You're always curious how accurate things are. You would be shocked how many times people talk about an election they show approval ratings, and they'll say something like, well, so-and-so has a 43% approval rating. This other dude has a 40% approval rating. And therefore, the one with the 43% is higher. Well, it's usually not true. Because if it's 43% plus or minus 3%, well, at the highest, it could be 46, but it might be as low as 40. We've got that range. 
Contrarywise, the person who's at 40%, plus or minus 3%, yeah, they could be as low as what, 37%, but they might be as high as 43. There's quite a bit of overlap in the two gaps, and if there is that overlap, that means that from a statistics point of view, we have to say these two candidates are neck and neck. I can't tell the difference between them in terms of statistics. Don't be fooled by the fact that one seems to go a little higher, the other seems to be go a little low. That could entirely be based on the people we polled. Let's say President Truman was running, running a race. Let's say his opponent and he seems to be falling inside the same confidence intervals. They had some overlap there. Well, President Truman might decide it's time to run a new poll. I need to be more accurate. So now he's not in the business of calculating a confidence range around his data. Now he's in the business of deciding how many people do I have to telephone to get a certain error rate. So now let's take a look at how this changes the problem. Again, notice these error calculations are always very the same, plus or minus E. But now we're going to change this just a little bit. I have two formulas on the right. They both start out with n on the left, n for number of people. These are both sample size estimation formula. And notice we've got two of them. One of them has p's involved. The other of them doesn't. That is the start and finish of the difference between them. Let's take a look. This one doesn't require us to know what P is. If Mr. Truman had no idea what his approval rating was, he might have to use this formula. It's got fewer data in it. Now we saw that his approval rating currently was plus or minus 3%, roughly. Let's say he wants to be accurate within 1%. Let's see what this would look like. How many people? must be visited or called to get E equal to 0 0.01. Now that's key. If you want to pick sample size, you have to tell people what your error is. We hadn't picked sample size. We just phoned a thousand people and found out his approval rating for the first round. And we found out that it was, what, uh, 40 something plus or minus, or 45 percent, plus or minus 3 percent. Now we want to drill a little bit deeper into the data and we want to call some more people maybe and figure out how many do we need to call if we want to get the error rate down to just 1 percent. Well, suppose Mr. Truman hasn't actually gotten this poll. He's just sitting at his desk in the Oval Office, picks up a phone and calls his chief of staff and says, I need you to run a poll for me. I want to figure out how much people like or dislike me in America, and it needs to be plus or minus 1%. Well, we don't know anything, so we have to use this formula. The number of people we're going to sample is equal to 1 fourth times the ZC score, and remember the confidence level we want is the ZC score we're after, so if we want to have a confidence level of 95%. So he wants how to get E of 0.01% with 95% confidence. Since it's a 95% confidence, we know to look up in our chart and we know we'll find the ZC score of 1.96. Suppose Mr. Truman wanted more accuracy. He wants to be within an error rate of 1% and he wants a 99% confidence level. Well then you'd look up the same thing and you'd find that you need to use the number 2.58 on your chart. So if you want 99% confidence, here the ZC is 1.96, here the ZC would be 2.58. Again, bigger ZC stretches those bars out a little bit more. In this case, though, since we're picking this all in advance, bigger ZC is going to mean we're going to have to talk to more people to get that level of accuracy. Let's say that Mr. Truman is sensible and prefers 95% confidence. 
picks 1.96. You pick the error. He wants to pick an error of just 1%. Take a second to watch carefully. You have to make sure that you're doing this right. For error of 1%, we're using the decimal form of error. That's fine. That means, though, that we need to be thinking about the decimal form of our p hats when we talk about it. So we're not talking about 46. So what am I saying? Don't write 1, 1 for 1%, because we're talking about our decimal form of the 45.4%, which will be 0.454. Keep your units the same, is what I'm trying to say. So this is our calculation. You can go ahead and pop this into our calculator. I have 1 fourth, 1 fourth times uh, parens probably, fraction bar 1.96, over 0 0.01, 0 0.01, if I can manage to type that in there. Close the parens, and this is what I have so far, but now I'm going to use this exponent button right here and pop a 2 in there, because we do have this squared term right here. And then I'm going to hit enter, we find out that n equals 9,604. Quite a bit more than 1,000 people. With 1,000 people, remember, we were able to get an error rate of plus or minus 3% at the 95% confidence level. If we went to the same confidence level, so we kept the confidence level locked down, if we want to get down to just 1% error, we'd have to pull over nine times as many people. That's a lot more polling. However, what if we, instead of running this as a, a single telephone barrage of calls to 9,604 random people in the United States. What if Mr. Truman had already run this poll? He knew he had a .454 approval rating. But he knew his opponent was too close. They have that overlapping scenario. In this case, Mr. Truman actually knows a little bit about how approved he is. Consequently, you can use a slightly more precise formula because he already has some good estimators for p. We already know about p hat. You can calculate this any way you like. If you have the data, you can calculate it using this one still. This will give you a bigger number. This is what you use when you don't have an estimation as to how liked something is. However, you can also do the calculation, if you have some information, you can also do the calculation using this one, which is the one we use when we have some sort of estimate for P. In that case, we'll calculate this just a little differently, because we happen to know that P is 0 0.45, 0 0.454 times 1 minus 0 0.454. Same term there on the right, notice, we just replaced the one-fourth with our estimators for how much approval we think Mr. Truman has. ZC over E, quantity squared, picking the same ZC of 1.96, and picking the same E of 0.01, we can recalculate. And if we recalculate this, I don't know, parens 0.454, 454, times, open parens, 1 minus 0.454, close parens, times, open parens, fraction bar, 1.96, all over 0.01, one last close parens, exponent squared, and hit enter. We have a different n. n equals 9522.7. It doesn't make sense to poll 0.7 people, so we round up. I will put a wiggly equals here, but we will round up all the same to talk about whole people. And now we compare. And here's what you'll find. As long as the approval rating is not exactly 50-50, in which case you'd have one half times one half, which we would call one fourth, then you would expect this number to be just a little bit smaller than this one. 
Now, unfortunately, in Mr. Truman's case, his approval rating, remember at the upper range was about 48 point something, so his approval rating is quite close to 50-50, which means to make a subtle distinction as to which side of that 50-50 we're falling into requires quite a few people if we want to lock it down to within 1%. Still, this has saved some phone calls, which can be convenient. The more unbalanced an approval rating might be, the fewer surveys you have to do to detect within a certain level of error. Same sort of thing works with a test. If you have a student in the class who's got you know, a sort of chaotic understanding of the material, sometimes knows it, sometimes doesn't, you might have to give several quizzes in order to somehow kind of figure out how much knowledge does this person have. It's hard to pin down. But if you talk to someone just once and they are able to say some of the brilliant stats to you, you think to yourself, we probably could have just gotten away with you know, a couple questions on a single final exam and 100% of the grades down to two questions. This person will be able to demonstrate all the knowledge, no problem. Whereas if you're having trouble, and on, conversely on the other side, if you've got someone who's never shown up to class, never opened the book, never looked at any of the homework assignments and done absolutely nothing the whole term, you talk to them for about two seconds and realize they know absolutely nothing. And you don't really need to give them homeworks and all these other things because you, know, you don't need to write down the final exam and grade it. You know what's going to happen. You're going to get it pretty much a zero. It's the stuff in the middle that requires more polling. And so in this class, we have quizzes and a midterm and a final and, of course, homework and clicker questions for the face-to-face -face folks and essays for the online people. All of this designed, and everyone has notebooks that they're writing, all of this is designed to get enough contacts because most students fall in some inner range here that's too close to the middle to get access to how much knowledge they exactly have without more of these poll questions. So that's how that works. So in this section, we've done a couple of things. We've talked once again about confidence intervals, and we've done our third variation of confidence interval, this time with binomial probability. And we also finally created a way to say, here's how many people we need to sample. And we had two formulae for that. One was if we had no additional data, we just knew how much confidence we wanted, what we wanted C to be, and we knew how much we wanted the error to be. And in this case, we did error with um, uh, uh, 0.01 for 1%. You could do error in anything that you wanted, as long as you kept your measurements the same. So you can calculate this formula out, and you could calculate it for, um, I don't know, you could talk about fishing, and talk about how long the fish are going to be. And you want your error to be plus or minus 2 inches, and you know that fish are normally a foot long. So then you translate two inches into whatever fraction of a foot that would be, and that could become your error. So you, you, you can do all sorts of things with this, but this is a pretty normal example. If you already happen to know a little bit about the system that you're in, you know a little bit about the world, then you can use the top or upper one. And the advantage of that is that generally you're able to shave off a little bit here. If this number had been a little different, like let's say 652 people, then we would have expected to have much different numbers here, which probably would have maybe pulled this number down to only 7,000 instead of 9,600. So we could have had some real significant confidence gains just by running a preliminary study. Run one study first to see how are things going, and then you can run another one. In the case of American politics, as a general rule, most surveys fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred. That tends to be enough. That tends to be enough because we generally know how presidents' approval ratings are. You already know their numbers from last week, and you say it's unlikely to have significant differences. Usually, this number is good enough to get plus or minus the 2.5% that you tend to see on uh, cable news 24-hour channels as they, they talk about people's approval ratings. Again, if you search Gallup um, politics, I think, Google Gallup politics, you'll be able to find some interesting information there um, about current presidents and Congress people, all sorts of people's current approval ratings, what Americans as a whole think about different um, topics. 
and generally this seems to be a pretty reasonable number of people to ask to get a decent error rate where you can say, yeah, I, I think I know how many people approve and it's within, you know, plus or minus 2%, plus or minus 3%. That's pretty close. All right. So, we've talked about these things. We've discussed the idea of calculating a um, confidence interval when we only had ourselves a... Uh, some data from a sample, and we somehow knew information about the population. We knew sigma. That's very rare. Then we talked about a much more natural type of problem, where we had only the, pop only the sample data, and from there we also had to calculate the sample deviation. We used TC scores, and we said the downside of that is that it tends to, in general, give us these wider bars between our uh, uh, lower and upper confidence level. Something that I keep on mentioning here that maybe it deserves to have a little bit of mention right now. C is the confidence level. And we said for ZC scores, if you want a 95% confidence interval, you'll see the ZC score of 1.96. And you can pick different confidence levels. And this is true for ZCs or TCs. As you pick a higher confidence level, that stretches these bars out. You find yourself multiplying by bigger Z's or bigger T's. As you get less of a confidence level, you tend to shrink these in. 95% seems pretty common. There's no magic reason why we chose 95% other than if I look you in the eye and say, I am 95% sure. That seems pretty solid. If I look you in the eye and say, 95% of the time, this is what happens. Well, that seems pretty likely. I can say 95% of the time that we generate this interval, I expect that somewhere in this range, it might be towards the edges or it might be in the middle, who knows, but somewhere in this range, I expect the population number, and if this range is pretty short overall, then you think that seems solid. Or if I only told you 70% of the time, that seems a little more flighty. So points that I want to make. I thought ahead and... Uh, grabbed a, a formula out of Excel, and I'm hoping to get some Excel videos on the website soonish, but I don't quite have them yet. Excel will calculate for you some of this, this confidence stuff. It'll calculate um, these, these numbers that you want, this, this error and whatnot. So the formula in Excel is confidence.norm. I think there's a confidence.tdis or something like that for the distribution. And if you do this in Excel, it will take three variables that you have to plug into it. Those variables are alpha, s, and n. Maybe really s is going to be um, sigma, right, for the norm? S for, for standard deviation. And for the, the net sample size. And you need this when you're calculating that e equals ec sigma over uh, square root n. I want to talk to you in just a second about alpha. Alpha is equal to 1 minus the confidence level. So if we have a 95% confidence level, alpha is 0.05. What you should do, because you should get comfortable with Excel, it is the best way to do well on the final exam. It is the best way to be able to plug in a lot of different numbers and really get to understand this. You can't possibly understand statistics just by watching me talk. You can't possibly understand statistics probably without watching me talk or watch someone talk. So you, you have to get the, the philosophy of it, and that's what these videos do. But then you have to get your hands dirty. And when you're getting your hands dirty, which I've managed to do quite literally now as I look at my hands with this whiteboard, um, but as you get your hands dirty, Excel makes a brilliant way to do this because Excel lets you code up many problem numbers and then you can just start changing some numbers and you can have Excel instantly recalculate. When you use our calculator, awesome as it is, unfortunately, you want to change a number, you really have to go in and type a whole bunch of new numbers and that's unfortunate. It takes a lot of time. Excel, you could set up a table and say, I want you to look here and you're going to keep on calculating average and you can change the numbers and see what happens. So confidence.norm, and if you just type equals and start typing confident, Excel will try to autocomplete for you. You can pick the right one. But alpha is just 1 minus the confidence level. So you want a 95% confidence level, you want an alpha of 0.05.
Alpha is telling you what is the chance that we made a wrong call. All right. So I think that kind of wraps up everything that I want to say today. I've got just a few seconds left for this part before we go on to the next section and the last part, I think, of uh, Module 7, uh, Confidence Intervals. So let me give you this insight, and I alluded to it just a second ago. Statistics is about two things. One is the mechanics of any calculation you want to do. The other is about the philosophy of how you decide which calculation to do. And no matter what you do in statistics, you know, I tend to let my students use a formula sheet because there's a lot of formulas. And the problem is, this is crazy. It's this, this insane fold-out thing, and I, uh, well, look at here. It's like if I had a contract and asked you to sign this, and said, actually, secretly, the contract's got 16 pages. Size 8 font. There's a lot of things that you can be technically proficient at calculating. And I would say this is the first step. Get technically proficient at calculating things. If you can't successfully calculate once you plug these numbers in and get yourself 9604, you've got problems. However, at the same time, if you're not good at looking at a problem and saying, which of these two formulas should I use, you also have some trouble. Those two things, when they work together, seem to work flawlessly. And maybe one of the biggest things that could be a mistake is you might look at me on this video. In fact, just last week, I had a student uh, come into my office, and they said to me, you're so smart. And I blushed a little bit, and I was grateful that that seems to be the case. But keep in mind, when I make these videos, I already kind of know what I'm going to do. You, know, you don't see all the times I hit pause and, and, and refresh and, and delete my stuttering out of here. So you really want to become aware that it was actually very hard. And I spent a lot of time not looking smart when I first tried to learn what is the difference between these two. The way you do it is you look at a problem and you say, which of these two can I calculate? Maybe that means if you're like me and you have to do a lot of practice before you become proficient at something, Sometimes this means looking at a problem and trying to calculate both. And when you do that, I discovered something. I found out that sometimes, in a problem, I couldn't figure out what P was supposed to be. I couldn't find any estimator for P hat. And eventually, it became clear in my head, and then I went back in the book and I read a little bit more, and I did this again. And this, of course, happened way, way back in the day when I took my first stats class. But as I did this, I realized something. The book finally pointed it out to me a little more clearly, but I was trying to calculate both of these for each for all the problems that seemed to ask for sample size, and I eventually realized if I don't have a way to estimate p, if I can't find any good p hat in the problem, that means I don't know. And if I don't know, this is exactly the formula I'm supposed to use. On the flip side of that, if I happen to have in the problem that happens to tell me, well, so-and-so's approval rating is so high, or 15 out of 20 dentists choose crest. Well then, I say, well, why would I use this formula when I can plug into this more advanced one that hopefully will give me a slightly smaller group of people that I have to survey? It's in the compare and contrast between different problems, which you'll sometimes have to look between different sections of the book to do, that will really give you insight. So as you're working through these sections, I want you to take a moment, step back to some of the earliest problems in this section, and say, why can't I calculate P for those? Why am I not going to use this confidence interval formula? Why am I using a T-score? Why am I using a T-score and not a Z-C-score with sigma over square root of N? And it will be when you realize, oh, in some of these, I don't have population deviation. I don't have sigma, so I don't dare plug into sigma. That's the philosophy side. Then there's the calculation side that you want to get good at. And a great way to practice both at the same time, I think, is using Excel. Because Excel, or really any, I don't want to tout just Microsoft, any spreadsheet program that has some statistical formula in it is going to give you the power to, first of all, if you can type out the equations correctly, then you're very close to having technical mastery, I think. And then, if you change some numbers and see what happens and what doesn't happen, I think you can start to get the philosophical mastery as well. 
as you're trying to calculate those things, as you're typing in those numbers, let me give you this piece of advice. It would be brilliant if you opened up Excel, and in Excel, every calculation that I do, if you were able to successfully code that up in Excel. Or go into the book. Remember, you already have to do your notebook problems from the examples inside each chapter, in each section. If you were to take those, which you already know the answer to, and recalculate them in Excel, that will let you make sure that you know how to use Excel. That will develop that technical proficiency. And while you're doing it, that will secretly also be giving you this philosophical insight. The combination of your notebook and maybe calculating those calculations in Excel will help to merge those two ideas and give you very powerful insight. Again, I, I can't possibly stress enough, everything we do in this class is real, it is active, it's powerful mathematics, it's powerful statistics. I use it all the time in, in very much real world scenarios that are very much, uh, they, they create job security for me, they create money, I want you to have this. You're going to have it if you marry the two, the philosophical proficiency with the technical proficiency. A little time spent thinking at that level of solving these problems as opposed to just how fast can I solve this homework problem and get on to the next is going to pay you very rich dividends, I think. So I think I am now flat out of time for this section, so I will see you in the next lecture where we talk just a little bit about not single point estimators, but maybe how we could compare a couple of points. And then we'll be able to go on and move on into the next module where we talk about some very fascinating things indeed. Until then, be safe.